So for this episode of Shop Talk, we're going to cover four items based around preventive maintenance. So what is preventive maintenance, why preventive maintenance is important, maintenance interval schedules, and preventive maintenance tips. So what is preventive maintenance? Um, for us, preventive maintenance uh, is regularly performed maintenance uh, to lessen the likelihood of a failure. Uh, ideally, it's performed while equipment's still working to prevent unexpected downtime. And something that a lot of folks don't think about on the preventive maintenance side is preventive maintenance isn't just changing oil. Preventive maintenance includes inspections, um, maybe some adjustments, replacement of components, performance testing, um, like uh, if you're familiar with technical analysis one and technical analysis two, uh, the TA inspections. Uh, the TA one is more of a visual approach and the TA two is a performance test. So um, we have all of these cool tools available to help us with this stuff. Uh, we should use them. Now, when we're talking about the inspection process, if you're not familiar with uh, CAT Inspect, it's a free tool that we have at our disposal and at our customer's disposal um, to, to help with these inspections. Not only can we create custom inspections if a customer is looking for something, they can create custom inspections, but also we've got all the inspections necessary when you're doing um, certain PM tasks that are uh, recommended by Caterpillar. So. Uh, it's a great tool, and uh, if you want to know more about the CAT Inspect tool, uh, we're going to have uh, CAT Inspect uh, on the, it's on the docket right now for uh, the Shop Talk series, so we'll we'll get to it uh, probably sometime in the month of May, maybe not, it's filling up quick, so we'll see. So why is preventive maintenance important? Uh, pretty straightforward. Improved system reliability, reduction of unscheduled downtime, and the biggest one here is lower owning and operating costs. You know, when uh, when our customers are out buying uh, the premium machine uh, that a Caterpillar is, um, you know, one of the benefits to that that machine uh, ideally is lower owning and operating costs, and by uh, performing maintenance. Um, then, you know, they can kind of see those uh, lower owning and operating costs. Um, you know, another addition to the lower owning and operating costs through maintenance uh, and improved reliability is a higher resale value. You know, there's a potential there where if a customer takes good care of their machine and and uh, they, they do their maintenance as necessary, uh, as recommended by Caterpillar, and the machine lasts a long time, then uh, you know they can get a, a good resale value out of it, and that's that's a good thing. And then lastly is the uh, parts inventory management. Um, you know, if uh, if you have a if you have a shop there and you got um, you know 50 filters sitting on the shelf that that are collecting dust, um, you know that might be five hundred dollars, it might be five thousand dollars worth of filters sitting there that the company can't use for something else. So uh, we always encourage our customers to to uh, keep keep what parts you need to have on hand, but uh, keeping extras on hand may not be the best uh, best monetary decision. You know, just to keep what you need and then call us and, and we can get more uh, more parts to you in a hurry. Which leads us to um, one thing that we're, you know, we're working on these these customer value agreements. This is um, this is a plan lubrication service option. So, just to clarify, this is not a full um, plan maintenance um, performance. This is only for lubrication. So Carter offers two options. So we have the uh, the Carter Performs. Uh, lubrication service with scheduled oil sampling and a cat inspect inspection uh, and then we have the filter kits option and uh, these both of them I think are, are really good tools that our customers have at their disposal they have flexible terms you know they've got you can do it for a year you can do it for three years or one two years whatever you want uh, they have plenty of options there and um, 
ideally they're they're purchased at at the point of sale for the new machine, but they're also available for existing fleets. And what what the kind of how the system works is uh, if you're signed into the system, uh, Carter Machinery monitors the hours on the machine at the 50 hour till the next service mark. Uh, we pick up the phone, we call the customer, and we say, "Hey, do you want?" Carter Machinery to come do send you the filters, or do you want us to come do the service, depending on which contract that you have? And um, so we schedule it with the customer. We or we'll send the the customer the filters out to their shop, and uh, it's directly shipped to them. And uh, they've got everything on hand needed uh, to to perform the maintenance that's due at that particular hour uh, mark. So. It's a really good tool, and uh, it, it provides uh, some discounted pricing on the cost of the uh, service if uh, our customers take that option, and it uh, discounted on filters if the customers take that option. So either way, it's uh, it's a good option for for a lot of customers. So now we're going to talk about the maintenance interval schedule. Um, the maintenance interval schedule is found in the operation and maintenance manual, which can be found in the back of the, behind the seat on most machines. That's either in a little uh, sleeve, or it's in a plastic box, or it just fits down in the back of the seat. But there's an operation and maintenance manual in there, and it should be cabled to the machine. Um, and uh, so, so we can't take it out, you can't move it. Now, if it's an uh, industrial application, then the operation and maintenance manual will be delivered somehow, some way with that with that uh, machine. But um, they uh, they vary by machine model, and each task is sorted in the maintenance interval schedule hours category. Um, and we'll look at that in more detail. So the OMM includes. Uh, all kinds of safety information that's very important to our customers. Uh, product information, maybe how uh, how much that um, maybe an excavator might lift in a certain situation. The operation section uh, would, might have a description of individual switches. Uh, if there's a switch in the cab that you don't know what it does, you can go back and pull your operation and maintenance manual out, and uh, it should tell you exactly what that switch does. The section we're going to look at today, the maintenance section, um, not only gives you the maintenance interval schedule, but how to perform the, that section of the maintenance uh, with with each uh, with each step of the way. So it, it's a pretty cool deal. So real basic maintenance interval schedule. They usually have it broken down into a few different categories: ten hours, and then you got a fifty hour, and then of course, you have initial PMs that that exist, and then 250 hours, 500 hours, all the way up, you know, 2,000 hours to to whenever. Um, so these things are broken out, and this is this a guide, right? So um, if we have a customer that that wants to extend their uh, engine oil change to 700 hours, they could certainly do that. But what they should do is seek some guidance. Um, from us to to get to that point, so we might uh, recommend, <clears throat> uh, or the, I guess the process for extending a, a service interval would be uh, at the 500 hour mark, uh, say your your typical oil change mark, um, and you want to stretch it to say 700 hours. Uh, Caterpillar says, well. At 500 hours, take an oil sample and let's let's run the oil sample. And if the oil sample looks good, then let's go to 600 hours. At the 600 hour mark, you take a sample and then you change the oil. And then while that sample is being processed, you go ahead and start the clock again. And then and when you get to the 700 hour mark, the next time around, or you know, you get 500, take a sample, 600, take a sample. And if the sample still looks good at 600, then go to 700. And you're stretching it basically in, in increments. So if you have an issue, you should pick it up um, in, in one of those increments. And then once you get a, a few of those 
seven hundred hour marks on a on a PM, then you can comfortably say, well, the oil can handle it. The, the filtration is fine, or or maybe we need to add a filter swap in here at some point in time. Um, that's how we can extend those uh, service intervals um, beyond what's recommended for that particular machine. Um, nowadays, with the advanced lubricants that we have, the filtration that we have, um, and, and quite frankly, the cleanliness of the systems, it's not, it's not out of the ordinary um, to see some of these intervals you know, expanding to 700, 800, 1,000 hours. Um, it's not, it's not out of the question for that to happen, but there's a lot of, a lot of checks that you gotta, you gotta meet in order for that to be done safely, but it can be done. So looking, uh, continuing to look at the uh, operation and maintenance manual. If you hadn't seen one of these before, it's pretty straightforward. This is the maintenance interval schedule. So on the top left-hand corner, you have uh, items that uh, need to be done when it's required. Um, so things like uh, the bucket tips um, on this particular machine, they want you to inspect and replace them uh, when it's required. The engine air filter, primary element, clean or replace, when it's required. So it's not every service that this stuff is done, it's when or as needed uh, that it's done. Every 10 hours and daily, you can see the list there. Uh, something that, uh, that we, we see uh, skipped quite a bit is uh, maybe seat belts. Um, you know, a tattered seat belt doesn't pass the uh, 10 hour uh, maintenance interval schedule. So that's something that should be spotted the day that it starts developing some wear. Um, a travel alarm, um, maybe the engine oil level check. These are all things that should be done every single day or every 10 hours of operation. Move over to the initial versus the every 250 hours. You have two different services there. So the initial is the first 250 hours of that machine's life, not not after you change oil, but this is the very first 250 hours. At that 250 hour mark, they want you to check the engine valve lash. They want you to change all the hydraulic oil filters. And the reason they want you to do that is during the manufacturing process, contaminants can get into the hydraulic system and they do their best to prevent that, but things happen and, and there are certain contaminants that you can't get everything out. So after that hydraulic system is closed up uh, and it starts filtering and doing its job, uh, they want to swap those oil filters out at that 250 hours, uh, the initial 250 hours, just to make sure um, that system's got a chance to, to remain as clean as possible. And then you go down to the 500 hour service. That's what we have uh, for this machine, engine oil and filter change, fuel filters are changed, your fuel tank cap and the strainer are cleaned. So each one of these tasks, they put them in the maintenance interval schedule because it's an important task. It has to be done. Uh, everything on these lists, um, you know, it, it's an important part of the machine. So that's why everything is included there. I uh, also note that uh, directly beside the uh, the title in the maintenance interval schedule, there's uh, some numbers there, and that's the page number in the operation and maintenance manual that you can find the process to to accomplish that task. That's what we're seeing here. In this case, this is a daily. Um, this is the fuel water separator drain. Uh, you've got some notes to tell you if there's maybe a safety hazard or an environmental hazard. It'll tell you, hey, this is, you got to be careful around this. This might be hot or this might, uh, this fluid might hit the ground. Um, so you need to have a catch pan or something like that. Um, so it gives us the servicing component, the illustration and the illustration key, and then the, the steps to accomplish the task. So in this one, Open the front access door on the left side. Get a suitable container for the fluid. Uh, open the drain valve, close the drain valve, close the access door. 
And so some, for somebody who's an experienced technician, this may not be a very difficult task at all, but they put in the owners and operating, uh, the operation and maintenance manual uh, because not everybody's a mechanic, not, not everybody has turned wrenches for a living, and they want to give a step-by-step -step instruction on how to complete this task. So uh, that's the reason they put it in there. All right, let's go through some tips um, on, on uh, PM. So we always want to park machines on level surfaces and, uh, of course, stay clear of other operations. So if we're on a job site working on a machine or working around a machine, we need to be off to the side, not in the work zone uh, where, where things are going on. We always want to apply the parking brake and uh, wheel chalks if, if your machine is a wheeled machine. Um, always attach that do not operate tag uh, to either the master switch or the start switch to, uh, to tag out the equipment before you, you start working on it. And the do not operate tag, they're easy to find. You know, you can get these things at Granger, you can get them at Fast and All, you can get them off of Amazon. You know, they're they're everywhere. They're easy to get. There's no excuse for somebody not to have it. And uh, you know, maybe if you got to run into town and get a filter, or you got to get some more oil, and you you can't uh, leave the machine sitting there um, where it can be started with uh, without oil in the engine. So you put that do not operate tag on there and, and disable the machine so nobody tries to, to start it. Otherwise, you may end up with a bad situation on your hands. We always want to maintain three points of contact whenever we're climbing on and off a machine. Um, avoid contact with hot surfaces and hot fluids. And then the last one there, prevent flammable fluids from coming into contact with hot surfaces. So. Um, if you uh, if you ever read the back of a of a brake cleaning can, it says uh, don't expose this to temperatures over 450 degrees. And what happens is you take a, a cleaner or a penetrating oil that that cannot be exposed to temperatures over 450 degrees, and you spray them on an exhaust manifold. It creates a gas, and that gas is a phosgene gas, which is a nerve agent. And it can do um, it can do damage to your body's central nervous system by uh, by exposing yourself to that. So we always want to tell people, you know, don't um, don't spray that stuff. Um, you know, if it says keep it under 450 degrees or 300 degrees or whatever it says, always 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 do that because there's potential health hazards that even right then and there won't. It won't damage you or kill you right then and there, but long term, uh, these can cause problems. So we all know that uh, that you know machines. They the, the adage is uh, what what people say. They don't build things like they used to. Well, in my world, thank goodness they don't, because the machines of today are far more productive and far more fuel efficient than anything of the past. Um, there, there's just there's no comparison. Our customers want more uh, productive machines. They want uh, cleaner burning machines. They want all these things. And the only way to do it in, in Cat's world is to tighten tolerances on everything. Um, where clearances now, instead of being uh, of being you know these huge clearances that can handle just about anything. Uh, machine cleanliness is more important than ever because we want fuel efficiency, we want strength, we want digging capabilities that we've never asked for out of a machine. So to put it into perspective, a human hair is about 80 microns. Um, if you look at a, a television that's turned off and you see a speck of dust on it, uh, that might be in that 40 to 50 micron range. Uh, and that's about the smallest you can see with your eye. Um, the clearances in the machines are between 2 and 30 microns, and that's, that's really more focused on the, uh, the lower end of that scale, um, uh, especially with modern fuel systems and, and modern hydraulic systems. They are definitely under 20 micron uh, systems, so uh, really, really, really important that we keep these systems as clean as possible. 
One of the big areas where we uh, where we can have some issues is with uh, with air filtration. Um, you know, it's not hard to dust an engine. They you can wipe an engine out. We've all seen it at some point in time. Um, a simple hose clamp or uh, somebody running an engine without an air filter or without a secondary air filter, and you can wipe the engine out. Well, uh, what Caterpillar says for air filters is uh, you can clean them for standard efficiency air filters. You can clean them up to six times. And if uh, you're running ultra high efficiency uh, air filters, you can clean them up to 10 times. But all that comes with uh, one caveat. And that caveat is you can't have, you can't clean the air filter any other way except for 30 PSI max air pressure from the inside out. So beating the air filter out on the tracks or on the tire of the machine, um, shaking the air filter sideways or upside down, all of those have the potential to have dirt pass through the media of the air filter. So Caterpillar says if you're going to clean an air filter, 30 PSI max regulated air pressure from the inside of the filter to the outside of the filter. Don't try to reverse it, or excuse me, don't try to uh, wash it, don't try to do anything crazy with the surface of the filter. Um, inside to outside the air filter, 30 PSI max, that is the limitation. Now, one thing that, uh, that we find a lot of times in talking to various customers throughout the years, customers are changing air filters when they shouldn't, they shouldn't be. Um, you know, that's just, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, argument both ways on this, but air filters should only be changed or cleaned when the air filter restriction indicator shows a restriction. So if, if we're out there swapping out air filters with perfectly good air filters, um, you know, there's, the, at the end of the day, we're costing a bunch of money on that owning and operating side, and we're not getting any benefit out of it. So uh, I encourage folks, don't change out air filters until uh, the air filter restriction indicator indicates that there's a restriction. Now, if you don't have one of these filter minders or uh, you, need, you need to get some, uh, you can contact the parts department. They can, they can find them for you. Uh, a lot of new machines have an air filter indicator that is uh, electronic with the uh, with the machine so the light will come on when there's an air filter restriction uh, some machines have both the manual type gauge and an electronic gauge um, so run it as far as you can and when the restriction indicator shows there's a restriction then you can change out the air filter or you should change out the air filter all right and then uh, the two most common hydraulic system failures you know, poor cleanliness and system contamination. That is that is number number one and number two by a long way. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of failures that just start from their own. They do happen occasionally, but most of the time, uh, it's poor maintenance or poor cleanliness of the system. Um, you've got a seal leaking and it starts sucking in dirt. You've got uh, something else going on to cause a cleanliness issue and a contamination issue that uh, that can cause problems with that hydraulic system. So we always encourage our customers to, to make sure you keep that hydraulic system as clean as possible. And I, I'm sure you've probably heard this before, but hydraulic systems are cleaner after they're uh, closed than they are when you put fresh oil in them. Um, you know, the, uh, the oil coming out of a container, it goes through a funnel or goes through a, a bulk hose and goes off to the hydraulic tank um, when you're doing an oil change. Uh, it picks up debris along the way. Well, after that system is closed up and you run uh, some good filters on that thing, um, eventually the system gets cleaner than it was when you put the oil in it. So um, that just shows how clean hydraulic systems need to be. Getting close to the end there, so if you'll hang tight with me for another couple minutes, we'll uh, we'll get through this. 
Um, fuel and oil filters, hydraulic filters, any kind of filter should not be pre-filled. And I know there's a lot of argument there on why you can or can't uh, pre-fill filters, but let's just talk about engine oil filters for a minute. That particular engine oil filter is a 1R1808. I think that filter holds somewhere around a gallon of oil when it's saturated. Um, that might go on, say, a 15-liter engine. Well, a C15, um, the oil pump on a C15 at uh, 70 PSI pumps uh, 72 gallons per minute, right? So if you put that oil filter on empty, then in less than a second, that oil filter will be filled up and pushing oil on to the rest of the system. One second of uh, maybe a, a le little bit less lubrication on the inside of the engine isn't going to hurt anything. It should have enough lubrication inside of the engine, in the, in the bearings especially, to be able to handle one second of runtime. Um, and that one second of runtime is basically uh, starting to turn the engine over till the engine reaches idle speed. So that's, that's no time at all. The disadvantage um, of pre-filling filters is that when you pour oil into a filter, where do you pour it? You pour it directly into the center of the filter. Guess which side of the filter is the clean side of the filter? The center of the filter. So if you fill that filter up and then you screw it on to the engine, then you just took oil, put it into the filter on the clean side, and now you're going to run that through the engine. I would almost rather have uh, no oil than dirty oil in that instance. That, there's, there's no exchange for that. So dirty oil you know, impacts the bearings. It impacts the embeddability of the bearings. Um, it's, it's not a good route. So uh, that's why we encourage folks, do not fill up oil and fuel filters or hydraulic filters or any other kind of filter before you install it. For fuel filters, we have priming pumps. You have either a manual priming pump or an electronic priming pump. And if you don't have a priming pump, then, uh, then we can look at helping you install one of those. But um, yeah, just don't pre-fill filters. Last bit here, and then we'll let you go. Um, we want to clean around openings before removing caps and covers. You know, wiping a dipstick off or, or wiping a, uh, a cap off before you open it up to add oil or check oil levels or anything like that is definitely unnecessary. Uh, we always want to install clean parts and components like hydraulic hoses, like engine oil hoses, like powertrain hoses. We want to make sure those parts are clean before they're installed. Always using the correct filters. You know, the, the Caterpillar filters are a better filter. I can say that with assurance because um, I, as much as I've studied cat filters, I can tell you they put a lot of effort into making a good quality filter. And I'm not talking bad about any, any of the other filters that are out there. There are some good quality filters out there. But those filters are made by companies that primarily make filters. Caterpillar makes filters, but they also make machines. And so their primary uh, thought with making filters is to make their machines last longer, not to make a profit off of filters. So we always want to use the correct filters, and I always recommend Caterpillar filters because they are a better filter. Now, if you want to know more about filters, we're going to have a shop talk on um, Caterpillar filters, all types of filters, um, later on, so keep your eye out for that. Uh, I've done deep dives into Caterpillar filters. I've talked to the folks at Caterpillar about the filters before. Um, they are a better product. And uh, so we always want to clean bases, use clean caps and plugs, and of course, keep parts and components packaged until they're ready to install. So if you're getting ready to install a filter, and it's wrapped in cellophane, leave it in cellophane. 
until you're actually getting ready to screw it onto the component that it goes onto. Keep them clean. All right, that's all I've got as far as PM is concerned. Um, next up, we have uh, machine connectivity. Next Wednesday, we've got an awesome one coming up on April 29th that's schedule sampling and SOS web. So how to use the SOS web portal. And we've got uh, Mike coming over from the oil lab that's going to talk to us about what the oil lab does, what they can see, what an oil sample means, uh, lots of cool stuff going on there. And then May 6th is the Cat Rental Store web portal and the app. So it's a pretty good time. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at shoptalk at cartermachinery.com. Or if you got any ideas for uh, new topics, then please feel free to, uh, to jump on there and, and give us your feedback. I'm also going to open up a poll. Uh, if, you, if you have a minute and you don't mind, uh, we'd like for you to take the poll and uh, see, if you, uh, see if you can gain anything uh, or we, give us any feedback that we could help you out with.